Uh, hello, I'm Aaron. Uh, I've been working on uh, DNS performance, availability, uh, service hardening for about the last 14 years at Microsoft. Hello, I'm Charlene. Um, I work on the platform engineering team at Bing at Microsoft. And over the last year or so, I've been working on creating a DDoS defense strategy incrementally as we've started experiencing bigger and more frequent attacks. Uh, we're here to share our experiences on DDoS and service hardening that we've learned over the last couple of years of running these systems. Uh, we might end up mentioning a few products in, in this, but it's really just for context, not really making any references for recommendations. Um, as you can imagine, in Microsoft, we've had uh, something like Microsoft Search, Bing Search has existed since 2008. There's been a lot of opportunities to create homegrown uh, observability, uh, service hardening and DDoS um, solutions. Um, in many cases, there's open source analogs that you can use uh, that'll, that'll, that'll mirror some of the things we're gonna talk about, and we use them in some cases also. But what we've really found is that uh, when you have custom systems, you kind of end up with custom solutions that and a lot of technical debt, right? So this is going to be our roadmap for today. Uh, we're going to start with why this is a problem that all SREs should care about then talk about some good SRE practices which help protect our service from DDoS attacks and more generally just failures under high load situations. We'll also cover the bare minimum functionality that we needed to implement to be able to do something about this attacks instead of just watching it go by. And finally, we'll spend some time talking about um, the nice to haves that make your system more robust and resilient. <clears throat> All right. So as the kind of the title of this, uh, this slide shows, is you, one of the things you kind of have to think about is, are, is, are our attacks getting worse? Or, you know, is this just a big problem? Is it just more chaos? And what we've kind of found, these slides cover the last five years, um, is that the overall quantity and volume of attacks is up about 95%, and the overall kind of exabytes of traffic per month has gone from about uh, 100 to about 330 uh, exabytes per month over that same time period. Um, those increases are mostly driven by like the increase in um, media content. So we, we kind of see that the trend of, of uh, attack frequency is really just kind of growing with the internet. We're not seeing some uh, spike that's taking us, making us feel like we need to be more worried than we usually are, other than DOSs are a pretty bad thing to deal with. Um, what we are seeing more commonly in, uh, in our services is the kind of the growth of people just downloading, uh, well, there's personally hackers uploading scripts to GitHub, and then it seems like just random people downloading them, um, running them from cloud services, kind of just to see what it looks like. A lot of these attacks uh, start and finish before we even have a chance to uh, get through the full alerting and uh, kind of manual intervention phase, which is not a great strategy, uh, but it's better than trying to explain the uh, sub-zero outage to Satya every week. Um, one of the reasons for, yeah, sorry. One of the reasons for the uh, perceived drop in effectiveness is that our, um, our partner CDNs and ISPs have gotten incredibly well at absorbing these massive attacks. Um, however, that was a painful lesson for us to learn in that the few percent of traffic that slips through a CDN or an ISP's uh, uh, protections can be enough to take you offline if you don't have anything uh, in place before that. And also that you need to have these protections in place well in advance because it can be quite difficult to deploy um, any of these strategies if you're barely able to stay online from so much DOS volume. Um, one of the things we try to do is train our leadership to understand that we will be offline or in an extremely degraded state uh, for as long as our attacker has more resources than we can absorb. Um, unlike other internal failures, uh, self-inflicted incidents, code rollbacks, things like that, we're not in control of the volume that's attacking us. Um, we make it clear that scaling out at like the ingress point is not a great strategy. It doesn't survive truly um, large uh, DOS attacks. 
Um, we need to invest in service hardening and what we refer to as graceful degradation that will protect against constrained resources uh, regardless of what the source of it is. Um, and these tools need to be done in advance, like I said, because it's very difficult to deploy them when you're basically offline. Um, luckily, we do have support for this work uh, from our leadership, so it's nice to have that priority. Um, as an anecdote, uh, we've seen that many attackers seem to just get bored and stop before we can go through the, the alert process, um, but that's, uh, that's much better than uh, it could be. Ultimately, a fully automated response is the uh, best way to handle these kind of sudden increases in resource constraints. We train our incident managers and SREs that there are kind of a couple different motivations for DOS attacks that could change the characteristics of them, the intensity of them, uh, the duration of them. Um, so like what can even be the point of some of the attacks? Um, obviously you can have just DOS as a goal, like, Microsoft has a lot, a lot, a lot of people that want to take pot shots at it. And uh, just to try to bash us, maybe get some internet clout. Um, these anonymous attacks with no known uh, purpose are really the most common thing we see. Obviously, we deal with extortion attempts also, definitely involved in law enforcement. We have a whole group of people who work on that. These are probably going to be the more protracted, uh, more well-organized type of attacks. The next kind of attack is that you need to pay attention uh, from that whole kind of observability mindset is that uh, the DOS attack itself might not really be just to like knock you offline. It might be to distract you. Um, it can keep all your, your senior experts focused on trying to get back online. And during that, that can make you very susceptible to social engineering. Um, so you can't let this kind of let your guard down and just focus on the DOS and not um, and you need to consider that this could be just one prong of an attack on your whole business. Uh, best strategy, again, in all cases, is to make it too expensive or too uninteresting for them to continue to attack you. Um, we try to enable each service to apply graceful degradation, as we mentioned before, um, and this in, in a decentralized manner so that we don't have to worry about communication protocols being overloaded. Um, we allow each of them to decide on their own what's the best thing to do. We send a signal down the stack, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and then allows the, each individual service to tailor its response, um, how it degrades the experience to uh, its best ability during these kind of attacks. So as much as we don't like DDoS attacks, turns out neither do our customers. And some of them feel very strongly about it for reasons other than just being annoyed at service disruption. Here are some of the comments uh, from an article about a company being taken down by a DDoS attack. Uh, my personal favorite is the second one, comparing paying ransoms to picking up a Molotov cocktail off the floor of your house and tossing it into your neighbor's house. Um. As a quick kind of survey, hey, who, who's, who's been attacked by a DDoS? Um, if you were attacked by a DDoS, did you actually, were you able to take uh, steps to mitigate it and intentionally you know, stop it yourself? Or did, you, did it end up just kind of playing out and stopping before you could do anything? Who actually took like, steps to stop it while it was still active? Um, and, of course, who thinks that they're adequately investing in uh, DOS preparedness? Right. Um, we like to think of it as the capacity test you never really wanted to, to plan for. Um, denial of service preparation is a service hardening task and it follows that life cycle that uh, many other service hardening tasks do, um, as you can see. You know, we, we're kind of uh, been through the backlog and into the chaos phase right now and have explained why aren't we ready over and over again. Um, one of the best strategies, of course, it can be to consolidate all your critical resources and your spare capacity behind a single service entry point. Um, that way you can include common enrichment features, 
um, and things so that every team doesn't have to come up with a plan and keep all that spare capacity online. But that's typically pretty hard to do when you have a lot of legacy systems or different teams that kind of have to justify their own existence. Um, also, like other service hardening tasks, uh, in, a, in a DOS situation, even if your defenses go well, you're probably still going to take some damage. Um, you're not just going to uh, you're not just going to eliminate the entire attack. Typically, uh, something that again that we've really started to focus on is graceful degradation. And again, that means that each part of the stack has some awareness itself or an ability to be informed from a higher layer that it needs to reduce the cost per request that it's it's consuming on, uh, during the attack. Um, sometimes that means lowering uh, queue thresholds so that you, you eject requests sooner. Maybe it means the start dropping known bot traffic and not giving them any experience at all. Uh, disabling experiments that are probably going to be voided anyway because of the traffic's uh, going to blow up your metrics. Um, priority queues can play a really big uh, uh, role in uh, um, degrading uh, sorry, in uh, handling DOS uh, increases. Um, any number of things can be applied um, no matter what the reason is for the resource constraint. And that's the important idea is we really don't plan for DOS attacks themselves. We plan for the resource constraint. And if you uh, can handle it, a CPU going to high for no, any reason, then you can handle it when it's a DOS attack. Um, and of course, if you do have it set up to handle that automatically, it'll just return to full features and full experience um, as the load decreases. As a core philosophy, if we try to degrade in ways that we can reason about, we can have conversations about, we can predict, and we try to make those intentional trade-offs um, before systems collapse. So in our experience, the first thing you get is definitely not an alert that says you're under attack from ASN1234 and you should just block it and everything's going to be OK. Um, a good distributed attack will truly look like an in organic increase. You can see it coming from all your normal countries, uh, your normal user agents, your normal um, browser, just everything. It just looks absolutely organic. And this, in, in honesty, creates kind of a problem. Over the course of years, you spend a lot of time filtering your metrics to only include your premium traffic, your known, like, your known users. You get rid of likely bots. You get rid of suspicious stuff. Maybe you've got a whole ASN that you don't like to pay attention to. That traffic still arrives, but you've excluded it from your uh, high fidelity, high important metrics so that your, uh, your on calls don't get woken up by just some scrape that you're going to block anyway. Um, and because you've done this, um, you can actually hide the increase in traffic, but not necessarily the increase in latency that's occurring in your systems. Um, and then there's kind of the obscurity of, since these attacks really come across from uh, diverse locations, uh, how many people actually have access to your, your CDN or your firewall portals and know where to look to see if you're getting ingress from all over the world versus it's just their piece of a system that's being overloaded for some reason. Um, it typically manifests as many systems failing at once, and each of those teams may not be aware that the other uh, teams are investigating something unless you have a centralized ops or a kind of a centralized um, incident management service that can go, hey, team A is dealing with this also right now, you might want to check with it. Um, this can also manifest, as some of the other talks have talked about, it's kind of a meta-stable meta failure. Uh, the load can come in, uh, like if you have a load tra uh, traffic load balancing system, the load can come in from maybe one relatively geographic portion of the world. That traffic management system sends it all to your East Coast data center. Your East Coast data center gets overloaded and fails out, rolls over to your central data center, and all you see is that increase in traffic at each of the arriving data centers, and you don't necessarily pick out the overall increase in, the, in traffic in general because, hey, the, the, the other data center's down, traffic's up anyway, let's go figure out why that data center's down. Um, so you really need to pay attention to, you need to really have engineers that have that kind of holistic view of, of um, why are we seeing so many failures at once? Why are they happening in so many places? Why does it seem like nothing we're doing is working? Um, if you have multiple origins with uh, load, again, with load, load aware traffic uh, feedback, um, as you can fail out of that one data center, 
it, it, that increase just looks natural in the next one. And then there's the uh, kind of the time of day awareness. Um, we have services that at uh, 2 a.m. in the morning can take a thousand percent increase in traffic and we wouldn't even notice. But at the same time at 2 p.m. on you know, Friday afternoon, we, uh, we only may only have 20% extra capacity and can go down for a much smaller attack. Um, so a DOS identification can really require a lot of service specific uh, context to pinpoint as the cause of your problems. Um, something that got us early on as a search engine was that we get a lot of people that like to scrape for say celebrity pages or they want to download all the cat images, whatever it is they do, they, they, some college students that are testing um, their most recent uh, scrape uh, or uh, page rank algorithm. Um, and so we see this huge increase in traffic coming from a single IP address and that just pollutes our metrics. So we put in a filter into those metrics that say, hey, just whenever you see a single IP spike like that, just only take maybe 10 events per aggregation period and carry on like nothing happened. Um, this was great until we had a very diverse, uh, di a very distributed attack and those 10,000 IPs all increased and that one filtering rule hid all of that increase in volume and again, we only saw it in latency. Because we were so focused on high quality metrics for alertability and making sure that people didn't get spurious alerts um, and that we had these, we could be confident that our, our, um, that our bots were filtered out, we basically blinded ourselves to what we successfully detected as bot traffic, but it just hit it in all of our metrics that we don't normally look at and um, ended up taking way too long to find as we had to manually dig through metrics and see the bot traffic. Um, you really need to automate this process. So um, I'm going to use uh, the metaphor of a filtering process uh, to talk about how we identify and block DDoS requests. You know, to filter effectively, you need to both understand how to remove the contaminants and understand what the final pure product looks like, really what a good request looks like for your service itself. On paper, this might sound like a pretty simple thing, but for us with you know, the large hodgepodge of markets and experiences that we support, um, this was pretty complicated. Thankfully, we weren't starting from scratch. Previous uh, investments, life side investments that we had put in over the years meant that our metrics and our logs were incredibly hardened and could survive this huge surge in traffic. And so when we started being able to detect DDoS uh, requests, uh, reliably, we could actually do it all the time. Now, another good investment that has unintentionally helped our strategy, uh, a few years ago to make debugging easier, we started uh, to enforce the existence and order of certain uh, URL parameters. And you know, we would enforce it by literally issuing a temporary redirect when a request comes in if something was out of order. Uh, this has helped uh, protect our service multiple times over the past few years. An example that comes to mind is last year, an attack uh, where the attacker left out one of these parameters, and instead of going down the stack, we just literally issued the redirect up front and didn't even notice the attack hour until hours after it had happened. You know, this is obviously a pretty uh, hacky solution, but a great one to use in a pinch. Yes, attacks can be configured to follow redirects, but chances are that's going to be a pretty expensive process for a garden variety attacker. All right, so this is the risky part. Demo. Um, one of the things that we really like to do is um, try to put together simulations for our systems so that we can test algorithms and reason about how things are gonna work together um, before we go live with it and All right, and so we end up with a bunch of little applications like this. Um, just really quick, what you're gonna kind of see here, ooh, that doesn't even show up on there. All right, well, the, the, the kind of the three blocks in the upper left-hand corner are data centers, and as we kind of mentioned, each data center has a different capacity. That ca capacity is, you know, you can't just say servers, you've gotta have some complex formula that actually kind of uh, equalizes the 
um, actual true serving capacity be between SKUs and CPUs and memory available and everything. And so also where your population is at, you've obviously got a higher density on the East Coast, a little bit uh, less on the West, and the Central is where we fail over when everything else falls apart. Um, so they also show individual pieces of the stack. So those little kind of little red line block there, each of those gray blocks is a, a sub portion of a system that we've identified has a certain amount of serving capacity underneath it because there's a fan out um, inside of say a service where one request comes into the uh, proxy and then it fans out to maybe 10 uh, services at the same time and it gets back the answer, formats it, sends it back. And so we know we have values at each of these different service layers that can kind of tell us when they're going to tip over given a number of ingress um, uh, requests. On the right hand side is kind of a mock-up of a search, definitely not a real search page, but definitely a search page, uh, that shows kind of there's, it's although it's one thing when you look at it on a web browser, it's actually composed of several pieces and blocks of things and, um, that all come from individual teams, individual services, and completely different stacks in many cases. And what we're gonna see is that, that you can either fit, like when you're under a load, this whole page can fail, or if you gracefully degrade, you can have individual pieces of this kind of fail, uh, this kind of page fail. Um, so what can happen is, so, you want to, these are the kind of the strategies we wanted to address, test, so we put the serving formulas into each of those gray boxes, and then we have what the degradation strategy is that we want to test out. And so maybe we want to lazy load these portions of the page when we're under duress, uh, so that, because we know the user's not going to engage with these sections for a few seconds after the page loads. Um, we can completely disable uh, low um, engagement content. You know, maybe we put stuff over here that's kind of trivial answers and things like that. We don't necessarily expect to make money or users to click on it that often, and if they don't have it, they may not even not notice it's there. So we can shut that down when, um, when um, we're under duress. Expensive content, rendering maps answers, doing geocoding, putting all together those map tiles, kind of similarly with an image answer. You've got to render those thumbnails, you've got to encode them, you've got to include them in response. Really a lot of overhead. If you can delay it or degrade it, you can get some capacity back. And then even though we're a search engine, we've got maybe we want to go down from say 12 re results as a default down to say six because every single result uh, does its own extra amount of work. And so by reducing the number of results, we can um, save the system. You're gonna see in this, uh, this section here, this is gonna be metrics about the kind of success and failures we have going on. And then we also use this to test the bot detection um, uh, automation that Shirlene's been working on, and we'll kind of see how this all flows together, hopefully. Um, so what we've got here is things are going great. We've got, uh, when the bar at the top is green, it means the, ser the server doesn't think it's under duress, everything's fine. You can see the kind of different loads at each of the levels of services because we understand the, the formula that, that kind of uh, each individual request causes down the stack. And right now we've got uh, basically uh, inbound traffic, uh, the black line, and being completely kind of aligned with the, the blue successful. Down in the left corner, this is kind of a, a, a accumulating statistics on the ASNs that might be, a, uh, you know, they're generating this load, and we want to see if we can find a pattern in it that we can use to protect ourselves with. So as we increase traffic a little bit, we can start to get to the point where we have just kind of random failures occurring. You know, this this could just be an organic event. This could be a you know, just a barely a, a DDoS that's, uh, that's just starting to tip your systems over. We're starting to see that these, let me slow down that flicker a little bit. The, um, we're seeing that in this case, because we don't have any of our protective measures enabled, the blockades or the graceful degradation, when any one of those uh, areas on that page are 
uh, turns gray, it means that whole page has failed. The user is getting back an error page because we haven't done anything. The page doesn't know how to compose itself when it's missing uh, the maps answer or the below the fold content. So right now we're just getting a random amount of a, uh, errors. As we push that up, as the DOS increases, we can get to a point where we're just basically, maybe there's some traffic fluctuating around, our traffic management systems are probably um, trying to throw traffic between data centers, that's a whole nother simulation. Um, but what we can see is that basically the error rate is almost 100% and a few people are getting pages, uh, but we're basically offline at this point. One of the earliest things you can do is, and, and basic things you can do, you kind of need information for it, is you could issue a blockade right at that very top layer and say, hey, we just know we can't take this much traffic, so let's protect everything just by turning on a blockade. And in this case, we end up ejecting about half of the traffic. The blockade for maybe it's on, um, uh, the block, it could be just the survival blockade that says drop a random percent of traffic. Hopefully it's more filtered than that, and as Mr. Sherlene will talk about. But in this case, we're back in a state where we're serving about half of our users complete pages because again, any failure at this point is enough to cause the whole page to fail. And that's not a great strategy. You can also see that the servers in the individual service layers are sitting at somewhere between 30 to 70% utilization and we're serving error pages. So our users aren't even getting the full um, opportunity to get a, a, a response when we have capacity to do it. So what we can do after that is, you know, again, we turn the blockade off and it's, it's just bad. Um, but what we can do is we can start enabling our, some of our graceful degradation features. And so like I said, these things are, needs to be reasoned about in advance and they'll trigger automatically due to thresholds that each of the individual teams thinks are appropriate. We also do capacity testing on like uh, more than a daily basis that automatically pushes these limits to see when these things happen. Um, and also, you know, we're gonna start to see a little bit more traffic from one of these ASNs. We can lazy load the below the fold content and since we're in a graceful degradation now, we're not just blockading requests at the top layer, we can say, hey, we can return a page that maybe doesn't contain these two fields or they get loaded by Ajax calls just a few seconds later um, and there's you know, no problem with that. We can knock out those low engagement features and only render them when the service thinks it's okay. So again, now you can see this green line pops up and basically says that we've gone from only serving errors to serving what we call a partial, re partial page or a de uh, partially degraded result, but the users are still getting an experience that contains, in our case, those, those uh, search engine results, those, um, and, and whatever else happens to survive um, at each of these graceful degradations. And again, we want to do this in the order that's the most important for your business. So now we can reduce the uh, super expensive complexity of the, the image answer and the map answer. And we're still saving all of that CPU that we're now maxing out um, to serve those search engine results that are the most important thing when you want to search. And as you can see, one IS, uh, ASN happens to be uh, streaming a lot of this DOS attack traffic. And finally, we can get to a state where we have um, all of this, uh, all of our graceful degradation features enabled. And at that point, you can really jack up load and you're just gonna keep getting some kind of slightly degraded experience. You could get users reporting that, hey, they didn't get the map answer. You know what, we really wanted to give it to you, but we couldn't right now. But we can do this, and this gives, our in, this gives us some leeway for our engineers to actually go in and figure out the problem, which in this case is that there's this ASN that's obviously generating load, and it's gonna emit um, some kind of a rule that has a signature like that, um, and we're gonna use that in the next part. Yep. So here. So um, we are now in a gracefully degraded state, um, degraded state, sorry. But also, we still are experiencing you know, a DDoS attack. We have to do something about it. At some point, even the degraded state is going to be too much. 
we did identify an attack from the previous uh, demo, you know, this one specific ASN. Um, but it could be a whole range of things. Uh, for us, it's you know, usually IP addresses or malformed user agents or query patterns that look weird or problematic ASNs, as we saw. But identifying a pattern is kind of useless unless you can actually act on it. What we now need is an ability to tell our servers to start blocking requests that match this pattern, and we need to be able to tell our servers pretty quickly. Uh, this led us to writing a pretty simple rule engine which could ingest a rule config that looks something like this. Um, and you know, we can deploy this as soon as we start seeing an attack. Although I would say, think carefully before trying this at home, you know, we had to write our own rule engine because this is directly in the request path, so we had some really stringent performance requirements. There are lots of open source rule engines you can use without having to do all of this work yourself. But I digress. We're finally at a point where our on-call engineers can actually do something about these attacks instead of just helplessly watching it happen in real time and hoping to God that it will stop. Um, so then we run into the question of where do we actually block this attack, uh, this request? Ideally, when we do um, bot filtration, we try to do it much further down the request pipeline because we're trying to minimize collateral damage. You know, we don't want to piss off our users by accidentally marking them as bot incorrectly. So this happens much further down the request pipeline after we've enriched this request with a lot of information like, you know, uh, geolocation and um, market detection and language and all of that kind of stuff. But during attacks, this is completely not a sustainable workflow for us. Uh, in this graph, you can see the latency spike uh, that we see in our very well-informed bot filtering process. So this spike actually is just the start of an attack, and you know, latency increases almost five times. And our well-informed service is going to be the one that uh, going to be the thing that will take the service down itself. So what we actually did was we started blocking these uh, uh, requests pretty much as soon as they come in almost the first thing as uh, the origin receives the request. This is a, a much less discerning hammer. We don't have enough information at this point. So there is a lot of collateral damage, but hey, at least the service isn't done, right? Now, at this point, we're feeling pretty good. You know, our metrics and logs are hardened. We can actually identify these uh, attacks pretty reliably, and we can now create blocking rules for it and deploy them. But this is in still a very manual process. And um, somehow, you know, it made our on-call engineers a little bit grumpy. For some weird reason, they didn't really want to, you know, identify patterns and roll out rules at 3 AM. So we really needed to automate all of this. <clears throat> Let me explain our approach using a real-world example. So we create an automatic detection service that ingests our near real-time logs and aggregates some statistics over dimensions that are useful for us. Uh, for example, a useful dimension might be new users per referrer. The next step is to actually compare uh, what our current rate of new users per referrer is uh, to what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. So for example, now if we start seeing a three times increase in traffic in uh, new users from referrer A, this is not really a normal pattern. This is not what we're normally expecting. Sorry. <clears throat> so at this point, our service will create a new bo blocking rule to block only new users from referrer A. And this rule will be deployed to a distributed NoSQL DB and then synced onto the local machine, all without waking anyone up. What ends up happening is now when the origin receives a new uh, a request that is a new user from referrer A, this request is automatically blocked. This is an example of a notification that we receive when uh, the service creates a uh, blocking rule. As you can see, the normal uh, upper bound for this is 30K, but if we suddenly start seeing 136K you know, within a few minutes, this is not normal organic traffic in any way. <clears throat> so at this point, you're probably thinking, you know, great, we can now do all of this automatically, everyone can sleep in, 
we're done, right? What else could go wrong? Turns out lots of other things. As we found out during high load situations, pretty much everything and anything will fail. Um, our automatic detection service, for example, has lots of very critical dependencies. There is the near real time logs, there's the service itself, um, there's the distributed NoSQL DB, and finally the workflow which we use to sync these rules onto local machines. If any or all of them fail, our machines are left completely unprotected. They have no idea of what to do at this point. How we solve this is um, we kind of had a bit of a paradigm shift, you know, realizing that like any good swarming algorithm, these machines should have the ability to do something for themselves to protect themselves. So what we do is we create a set of uh, default very general rules that we deploy with the service itself. Um, and if a machine starts seeing critical amounts of traffic where it is just going to fail, we start blocking on these rules. Now, because these rules are general and default, it, you know, there's a lot of collateral damage. For example, a rule could be, let's just block all requests that don't have a referrer header. So yeah, lots of collateral damage, but hey, at least the machine isn't going down. Now this graph is a performance test um, that we ran on machines with just these local rules. Uh, as you can see, the blue line is uh, the rules are in a report only state, so nothing is going to be blocked, the traffic is just passing through. And when we hit about the 4.2K RPS mark, this is when the machine starts experiencing trouble. You know, latency increases incredibly, and then um, comes back down as the machine itself just fails. It starts dropping requests um, and just goes offline. The green line is when we actually start applying these rules. Um, at the lower latencies, uh, sorry, at the lower RPS, none of these rules have a huge performance impact. But when they do start blocking at around that same mark, even then, the latency remains steady, and most importantly, we are still serving known good traffic. Okay, let's do a quick recap of all the stuff we've covered so far and where our current defense strategy is. So, we can now detect attacks reliably. Our logs and metrics are hardened. We can also block traffic based on, you know, all the parameters that matter to us. We now also have automatic detection and rule creation in place, so no one needs to get woken up. And finally, we have some local rules as a final layer of protection just to prevent the machine from going down. But now that we have a bit of breathing room, we can finally think about how do we make this better? You know, there's a lot of collateral damage in all of this, and we don't really want to block requests outright. So let's bring in graceful degradation back into the mix. So far, our filtering module has been blocking requests and just literally returning either you know, a throttle or whatever. But we can now make this a little bit smarter. We can allow all the services down the stack to make more informed decisions around how they want us to react. This could mean throttles, for example, or it could mean deprioritizing you know, these requests in favor of more important ones and I'll talk more about that in the next slide. We could even opt out of calling the more expensive services like the maps answer and return either a cached experience or nothing at all for that answer. Uh, we could do a temporary redirect, as I mentioned earlier. And lastly, we can even issue a capture challenge so that you know, the real user has a chance to prove that they are human and we are able to slow the attacker down further. <clears throat> so, let's talk about how to deprioritize requests. Now, to really deprioritize a request, we need a concept of what an important request looks like. We do this using something called client reputation, which is the ability to examine a request and make a judgment on how valuable it is to your service and the risk it may pose to your service. The concept behind this is pretty straightforward, but the execution can be highly custom to your service because you know, this is you understanding what your requests look like. 
But let's just talk about the high level view. So request comes in and it enters a client reputation module, which ideally is situated in your front end proxy layer so that all the services down the stack can get the benefits of it. Uh, this module has a bunch of inputs. Uh, for us, it's things like which market is this request coming from, uh, previous bot detection results for this user, or even just is this IP in a watch list. We then aggregate all of, these, all of this data and distill it down into a single number out of 10. High score means that this is a pretty good request. We believe this is organic, real user traffic. Low score means this is dodgy. We then send the request just down the stack with the client reputation value added as a header. Now, what this means is that all of the services that get this request can take this value and decide what they want to do with it. Do they want to process this request at all, or do, you know, do they just want to drop it? Okay. So, yeah, I know, abrupt. This was uh, pretty much all the content we had for you today. Thank you so much for listening to us. I'm gonna do a quick summary to kind of just tie everything back together. Now, DDoS attacks are becoming more prevalent in the industry and without even a minimum, bare minimum defense strategy, you can and probably will go down. At the minimum, your system needs you know, robust logging and metrics and just a way to block requests, a way to respond to an attack. Your nice two halves are automatic detection, because being woken up sucks, um, client reputation, so you can actually prioritize your requests. And lastly, the unifying factor, graceful degradation, empowering and enabling every service that you serve to actually make a smart decision about how they want to fail. Yeah, questions? Thank you so much.